Right, welcome everybody. This is a lecture course on cosmology. Hope everybody is in the right room. My name is Volker Perlik. My email is perlik at sound and I have to explain two things about this lecture course. First, why do we do it in English? And second, uh, why will it be recorded? The reason is that this course is addressing two different groups of, um, uh, groups of audience. One is master students here in Bremen. I think that's the majority in the room. So you can take this course towards your master degree if you choose this uh, module astrophysics. It is worth ten, uh, sorry, uh, six uh, credit points, so you can combine it with some other course from this module, which gives nine credit points, and then you could do an exam in this module if you like to do this. Of course, you are very welcome just to attend <laughs> without uh, taking an exam. So that's one group. And the other group is PhD students in our graduate colleague, Models of Gravity. And many of, actually the majority of the PhD students is not from Germany. So they do not speak German, at least not uh, very easily. So that's the reason why we have to do it in English. I hope that's no problem for anybody. And the second reason is that these PhD students are distributed over Bremen, Oldenburg and Bielefeld. And the ones from Oldenburg and Bielefeld cannot come twice a week to Bremen to attend this lecture. So for them we will record it. This is also of advantage for all of you. If you miss a lecture, you can watch the recording afterwards. So I think that's... And the camera is, is uh, pointing above your head, so you're not in the, in the frame. You can behave quite, <laughs> quite, uh, quite relaxed. Uh, yes, so that was the first thing I had to announce. Um, the lectures will take place uh, Tuesday from... 12 o'clock to 14 o'clock here in this room. So this will be lectures. And then we have Friday from 12 to 14. There the first half will be lectures and the second half will be tutorials. The tutorials will not be recorded. So we can do this quite relaxed among ourselves. Yeah? And uh, of course, uh, during the lectures, you might feel free to ask questions in German if you prefer to do this. I have to repeat the questions anyway because you, you, are not, uh, you will not be understood over the microphone if you ask a question. So I have to repeat it anyway, so I would repeat it in English and uh, that, that should work, uh, work fine. So, uh, as I said, the second half of the Friday lectures will be tutorials. So what we do is, every week I will hand out a worksheet and then in the next week we will discuss the problems together here on the board. So my hope is that one of you comes to the front and presents the solution and then we discuss uh, uh, them together. I will not mark the worksheets. There's one thing, I love my, my job, but there's one thing I really hate, and this is marking it. <laughs> so if I can avoid it, then I do avoid it. <laughs> and I think uh, you, you will also get, get the, the solutions in written form afterwards, so I think uh, it's no disadvantage for you if, you, if, if the worksheets will not be, be marked. Okay, so as I said, this, uh, this course is addressing, among other things, the master students here in, um, here in Bremen in this module Astrophysics. And what we do in this module is, um, as far as relativistic courses are concerned, we have a course on general relativity in the winter term. And then we have a specialized course on some particular topic related to general relativity in the summer term. And this cosmology course is one of these specialized courses. So the ideal case would be if you had taken a GR course before that. Yeah? So if you talk about cosmology, now in, yeah, in the 21st century, this will be something about general relativity. Yeah, you cannot do cosmology in the 21st century without general relativity. So the idea is that you have a basic knowledge on general relativity. So, for instance, if you have taken the course which Eva Hackmann gave last term here, this would be an ideal uh, prerequisite. Or if you have taken some other GR course, that would, of course, uh, be equivalent. Or if you have read a little bit about general relativity, so if you have some basic knowledge. If there's somebody in the audience who has never seen the Christoffel symbol and he has never heard the word energy momentum tensor, then I would think that it would be difficult for you to follow. Yeah? You are very welcome. Everybody is welcome. I will not uh, uh, chase away anybody. But uh, the course is meant for 
for people who have some basic knowledge of general relativity. I will repeat the basics of general relativity in, yeah, in two lectures or something like that. But uh, of course this must be very short yeah, because we want then to talk about cosmology. And uh, so it's, it's meant more like uh, yeah, reminding you of the basic notions and introducing the, the notation, not more than that. But if you have never heard about general relativity before, then it will probably be a little bit difficult for you. Okay, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, literature. So, as I said, I will, uh, I will send, uh, or have I said it? If not, I say it now. I will send out written lecture notes at the end of each week, together with the worksheets for the next week. And um, uh, this will be more or less precisely what I've done on the board. But nonetheless, I would encourage you also to read other sources, to take some other textbook for complementary reading or some review articles, and for that, reason I will give you some, uh, some references. So this is a yeah, very personal view, very personal selection. Of course, there's a huge literature on cosmology. So I will mention a few textbooks on general relativity, which have extensive uh, chapters on cosmology with sections on cosmology. And as I said, I've chosen my, my favorite ones. So certainly one of my favorite textbooks is the one by Wolfgang Rindler, who was one of my teachers. He is 92 now, but as I, I've heard, still very active <laughs> and in very good health and, uh, uh, and still giving lectures. Yeah, in the US, you, you are not... Uh, you are not um, you don't have to, to go into retirement, you can teach as long as you like, and he's still doing the, the full business of a, of a professor in, in Dallas and Texas. And uh, he's the person who invented the notion of event horizon and particle horizon in his PhD thesis in 1955. And he has written a textbook, which is just called Relativity. And I think it's Oxford UP. Oops. Yes, it's Oxford UP. And the most recent edition is from 2001, I think. So older ones. But uh, so this, I, th I would say, uh, maybe the, the, the last quarter, or maybe even the last third of this book is about cosmology. And it is as easily readable as a textbook on GR can be. Yeah? If, it, if you speak on GR, it, you cannot, it cannot be a really easy read, yeah? but it's as easily written as it can be. So he keeps the mathematical formalism to a minimum, concentrates on physical interpretation, and it's didactically very well written. And uh, so for a first reading, that's one of the books I always recommend most. Then there is a book by Hans Stefani. He was a member of this, this famous Jena group in the GDR worked on exact solutions of general relativity and uh, uh, Hans Stefani wrote a textbook first in German and then it was translated in English Then it's also called relativity and the English version appeared with Cambridge UP and the most recent version appeared actually posthumous in 2004 I think Hans Stefani died in 2001 or 2002 so this is, all, uh, this is mathematically, it goes more into mathematical detail than the book by Wolfgang Rindler. But uh, it's still, I wouldn't say it's mathematically sophisticated. So it also keeps uh, the formalism fairly basic. And then one of, uh, again, one of my favorite, where in particular the chapter on cosmology is, in my view, very well readable and uh, gives a very good introduction into the modern development, is a book by Lewis Ryder. It's introduction to general relativity. That's a fairly new book. It appeared in 2009. In contrast to these two, Lewis Ryder is, uh, did not research primarily in general relativity. He comes from quantum field theory, actually. He has also written a very well-known book on uh, quantum field theory. But uh, yeah, he became interested also in general relativity and wrote this, this very, nice, uh, very nice textbook in 2009. Okay, and then of course there are many, many monographs on cosmology. 
I will mention only two of them, which for the purpose of this course I think are particularly appropriate. So I should say that my background is in general relativity. My background is not in astrophysics, and certainly not in particle physics. So if somebody with a background in astrophysics or in particle physics talks about cosmology, he would do it in a different way than, than somebody who comes from, from general relativity. So for instance, Steven Weinberg, the famous particle physicist, the Nobel Prize winner, he has also written a book on general relativity and cosmology. But he, as a particle physicist, he sweeps the geometry completely under the rug. Yeah? So for him, uh, yeah, gravity is just a spin two field on flat space time. Yeah, that's the impression which you get from reading this book. That's, of course, not, um, uh, not the view you would prefer if you come from general relativity. So, uh, so for this reason, I concentrate, or I've, I've chosen two, uh, two monographs uh, where the geometric aspects are uh, in, the, uh, in the foreground, or at least not swept under the rug. And there is a one by Slava Mukhanov, who is a professor in Munich. He's Russian, of course, uh, as you can uh, assume from his name, but he is since many years in Germany. And the book is entitled Physical Foundations of Cosmology. And the first half of this book covers more or less, ex more or less exactly what I'm planning to do here in this lecture course. Uh, well, of course it covers much more, but uh, <laughs> everything of this kind is contained. This is again Cambridge University Press. I'm not paid by Cambridge University Press, but actually the mo most of the books I've mentioned are, are from them. So actually I'm, my personal relation is more with Springer, but uh, these books I've chosen here, they are almost all from Cambridge. <coughs> this is from 2005. And the other one, which I want to recommend, is from three of the leading relativists of our time. This is from George Ellis, Roy Martins, and Malcolm McCallum. And it's called Relativistic Cosmology. So already from the title you can see that they write from the viewpoint of relativists. This is again Cambridge, and that's fairly recent. It is from 2012, UP. So these are the books I want to recommend. There are many more, as I said. Maybe the, the most famous and most quoted book on cosmology is the one by Jim Peebles. So I should mention this also, but uh, he is also a person who doesn't come from the geometric side. So for this reason, I would say that it, it's an excellent and very interesting textbook, but for what I'm planning to do here in this course, I think these two are more appropriate. And then there are, of course, there are many review articles. Uh, well, if you have a relationship to relativity, then you know probably this series of living reviews in general relativity. So that's a series of online articles, which are supposed to be regularly updated. Not all of the authors actually do this regularly, but that's the idea. That's why they are called living reviews. So, and there are three of them, at least three of them, which are of interest for, for this course here. I want to mention them also. So you find them online under, what is the address? HTTP uh, Relativity Living Reviews Org. No, it's this little L. Let me write it readable. So you find review articles on virtually any aspect of relativity in this series. And there's one by Neil Jackson. Which is entire. So if you, if you go to this address, then you get the whole list. Here are all the titles, all the authors, and you can easily find the particular ones I'm mentioning here. This is about the Hubble constant. Then there's the one by Sean Carroll, who is also the author of a very well-known relativity textbook. Typical American style. He has a big format with, uh, with uh, many inserts and things like that. And he has written a living review on the cosmological constant. Mm. 
Oops. And finally, the third I want to mention is by Jones and Lazenby. Anthony Lazenby is also co-author of a well-known textbook on GR. This is on the cosmic microwave background. And of course, all three subjects, the Hubble constant, the cosmological constant, and the cosmic microwave background will play an important role during this course. Okay, so much for the literature. Oops. And, uh, well, I will give more specialized uh, references uh, when, we, when we talk about particular subjects. Yeah, what is the content I'm planning to, to cover in this course? Maybe I should exchange this, maybe it's better readable. Oops. Oops. So as I always do, or most, uh, with most of my courses, I begin with a historical introduction. So it's my belief that, well, it's certainly not necessary to know about the history of a subject in order to, to understand what's going on. But uh, in my view, it's always very helpful if you can, uh, yeah, if you can uh, put uh, the things into a historical context. So I will begin with a historical introduction. That's what I will, I'm planning to do today. Then I will give a brief, uh, how did I, review, I call it a review. Yeah, this is a <laughs> maybe even a too strong a word. It's just a brief recap of general relativity. So as I said, my hope is that you have a basic knowledge on general relativity, so I will remind you of the basic notions, and in particular I will introduce my notation. Yeah, there are different conventions, and uh, I have to fix this for the rest of the course. Then we will discuss homogeneous and isotropic cosmologies. So the space-times, which satisfy these symmetry assumptions, so we assume that the space, not the space-time, the space is homogeneous, so all points in space have equal rights, and all directions have equal rights. Yeah, so that's, uh, of course, it's ide an idealization, but it's astonishingly um, uh, isotropic, as a word, isotropic. Uh, yeah, it, it uh, carries uh, astonishingly far, actually. So the, yeah, the bigger part of cosmology, what we nowadays assume to be correct and what we, what we do in order to describe our universe as a whole, is done within these models. And then the rest is put on top of it in, the terms, in terms of small perturbations. Yeah? But the homogeneous and isotropic models, they are the basic and they, they cover most of the, of the qualitative features. And if a spacetime has this symmetry, yeah, if a spacetime model is spatially homogeneous and isotropic, then one calls it the Robertson Walker universe. So we will speak about Robertson Walker universes. And here we will discuss in particular the redshift distance relation, for instance, redshift distance relation. We will talk about horizons and other things. So this part will be purely kinematic in the sense that the field equation is not used. Yeah, so this is a, a subsection. So I, the terminology is not quite unique in the literature, but I think the historically correct uh, terminology is to call a model a Robertson-Walker universe if you just make the symmetry assumption, if you don't speak about the field equation. If you look for a solution to the field equation within this model, then you get what is called the Friedman solutions or the generalized Friedman solutions. So you can do it with cosmological constant, without cosmological constant, and so on. So we will, this, uh, we will uh, separate this uh, section into two parts. This is purely kinematical, without the field equation, and this is with the use of the field equation. And then we will confront this with observation. So we will talk about observational evidence for homogeneity and isotropy. So we will then discuss to what extent these theoretical assumptions are actually 
verified by observation and isotropy. Well, and what kind of observations do we have? It's essentially three, three, uh, yeah, three classes, three types of observation. It's a Hubble law. Yeah, the observation that the distance is proportional to the redshift. The redshift is usually interpreted as a Doppler effect, and then it means that the farther an object is away, the bigger is the velocity with which it moves away from us. So we live in an expanding universe. That's what this model tells us, uh, this um, observation tells us, if you accept this interpretation. The second one is uh, cosmic background radiation. which we observe and which comes towards us uh, to an extremely high degree in an isotropic way. So it comes to us from all directions in the same way. Yeah, we, we observe this radiation. It's a black body radiation, so we can assign a temperature to, uh, to it. And the temperature is the same in all directions to a very high degree. There are small deviations, but they are really, really small. So this is our, the, most source, uh, the, the best source of, um, of information which tells us that our universe is isotropic to a very, very high degree. And then we have gravitational lensing, which also gives important, important input. In particular about the large-scale structure. Uh, so uh, these are, in essence, the three types of observations we have, which we have to, um, to evaluate. And we will see that they, that they confirm these assumptions of homogeneity and isotropy to a very high degree. But they also tell us that it's not, that it's, of course, not, uh, not ideally, not absolutely perfectly. Yeah? So, of course, our universe isn't perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. There are deviations on a certain length scale. And, of course, we also want to model these deviations in an appropriate way. And this will then be the fifth and last section cosmology beyond. Uh, homogeneity and isotropy. Isotropy. Well, and the first thing, what you do, what, which actually, actually carries very far, which um, uh, helps you to explain more or less all observations is that you do perturbation theory. So you start out with a homogeneous and isotropic universe and then you apply small perturbations to it and you try to explain all the observations which we have in terms of these perturbations. But, uh, well, being a relativist coming from the theory of general relativity and uh, being interested in exact solutions. Of course, I also want to talk a little bit about exact solutions, which are not homogeneous and isotropic. So, exact cosmological solutions of the field equations beyond the Friedman solutions. Cosmological solutions to the field equation. It depends a little bit on time, how much I will, I will do. So we have to see how far in the semester we are, if we have reached this point. But I think I will certainly talk a little bit about Bianchi models. I might mention the Gödel cosmos, this highly, highly um, yeah, pathological, rotating cosmological model, which Kurt Gödel um, uh, uh, invented as a birthday present to Albert Einstein on occasion of his 70th birthday. Yeah? So he, yeah, so he, as a gift, he gave him a solution to his field equation. It's a much nicer <laughs> gift than, I don't know, a bottle of wine or something like that. Yeah. So that's uh, the Gödel cosmos. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. But, uh, what, what I, maybe Kantowski sucks, but uh, probably Bianchi models a little bit and uh, Gödel. And then I hope that I have time at the end also to speak a little bit of uh, the character of the singularity. So we will see that uh, the universe, already in the class of these models, we will see that the universe starts with a big bang, that these are the models which are favorized by observation. And then you may ask, what happens to the singularity if you perturb the symmetry a little bit? This is maybe an artifact of the, of the symmetry. So if we do not have the strong symmetry, is the singularity then going away? And actually, this is not the case. The character of the singularity 
So there was famous work well, going on in parallel in Russia and in England. In Russia it was um, uh, brought forward by, by three gentlemen by the name of Belinsky, Kalatnikov, and Lifshitz, usually abbreviated BKL. So they studied uh, uh, the way in which the singularity is, um, is approached. And in parallel, so this actually they began a little bit earlier. I think the first paper from this group is from 1960. And then a little bit earlier, 64 or so, Penrose and Hawking started working on, the, on their famous singularity theorems. Penrose, Hawking. I think most of you have heard about this. It's a work which made uh, Stephen Hawking famous, Singularity Theorems. And I hope that I can say a few words about this. Certainly not in very great detail. Actually, two times in my life I have given courses on the singularity theorems, where the whole course was on these theorems. And I couldn't cover the proofs of all three theorems in this, in this course. Yeah? So when we have here maybe a week or so for this, I will, uh, I, certainly it would not be possible to give more than a, yeah, than, a, than, a, than a flavor of what this is about. But I want to address this uh, subject in, uh, in some way uh, to make sure that, uh, or to uh, to emphasize to you that uh, this, um, this conclusion that our universe started with a Big Bang, if we accept this classical theory of general relativity, that this conclusion is not an artifact of the symmetry. Yeah? It can be proven under very general assumptions. So the assumptions are something like uh, the energy density is positive and um, and some uh, and the so-called generic condition, which is satisfied in um, in all space times, with the exception of a set of measure zero. This kind of assumption goes into the theorem, but no symmetry assumptions. Okay, and that's it. So I hope that uh, I can cover this in the course of um, of this of this term. And now we can begin with a historical introduction. So as I said. If we do cosmology in the 21st century, then it's a theory within general relativity. But I will make at least one remark, one historical remark on cosmology before general relativity. And this is related uh, to a person who, um, who lived here in Bremen, namely to Wilhelm Olbers. So my first, um, my first entry here is from the year 1826. So this was definitely before general relativity. And this was uh, the time when Wilhelm Olbers formulates what is called the Olbers paradox. Actually, the Olbers paradox is really a big problem in Newtonian cosmology. So if you want to formulate a cosmological theory with a Newtonian theory, then this is a serious problem. And um, well, what is it about? Uh, Olbers started out from the simple question, why is the sky dark at night? So obviously the sky is dark at night. So if the sky is dark at night, then the radiation energy from all stars, which arrives here. Here all the stars are radiating, the light comes towards us, and the radiation energy is infinite, provided that yeah, the universe is static and eternal. And that's what most people assumed at this time for ideological, philosophical, or maybe even religious reasons. Yeah? So the idea was our universe exists forever. It has the same form at all times. And Newtonian physics is true, of course. And then it's actually an easy calculation that the sky should not be dark at night. It should be yeah, blazingly bright. 
So if, if a child asks uh, uh, its parents, uh, why is the sky dark at night, the parent would probably answer, because the sun is down, yeah? Because the sun is on the other side. But there are also the stars. And if the universe is infinite, and if it is in eternal, then the stars should produce an infinite radiation. And this, the calculation is easy. Let's assume each star has a, a luminosity L, a true luminosity L. And if it is at distance r, then what arrives here is L divided by 4 pi over r squared. Yeah, because the total luminosity distributes over, uh, over the sphere of area 4 pi r squared. And now if, this is for one star. Now if the stars are distributed with a density n, and they are really everywhere in the universe, then I have to integrate this expression over the whole, over the whole Euclidean space. So I have to integrate theta from 2 to pi, phi from 0 to 2 pi, and r from 0 to infinity. And the volume element, as you hopefully remember, is this here. I should use the same theta here and here. The r, d theta, d phi, right? So that's the radiation energy which arrives with us here from all the stars. Yeah? This is the luminosity of each star. This is the density of the stars. Yeah, and the rest is uh, just uh, Newtonian physics, Euclidean geometry. Well, and uh, even I can integrate this. So if I integrate, uh, uh, well, first of all, well, you might assume that L and N are constants, and I can take them out of the integral. If you assume that they are not constant, if the different stars have different luminosities and the density is not quite constant, you could use a mean value theorem. And again, you could pull the LN out of the integral. So let's do the second argument, yeah. LN averaged. Let's put this, this in front of the integral. That's the mean value theorem. Then we have the 4 pi here, the r squared cancel, right? And then what do I have? I have an integral over sine squared theta d theta d phi. This gives again a 4 pi. And I have only the r integration. Okay? So this goes away. And this integral obviously is infinite. Yeah? This is infinite. So this was a little calculation all of us did in 1826. And he came to the conclusion, well, the universe is, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sky at night should be, should be bright. It should be infinitely bright, not dark. And well, obviously the sky isn't infinitely bright, so what is, what is the reason? Something, some of these assumptions uh, obviously are not true. And Olbert suggested an explanation. He said, uh, well, probably there is matter between the stars which absorbs part of the radiation. Yeah? And then, so the stars which are far away, they have to take a long way through these matter between the stars, so their radiation is largely extinguished by absorption. What do you think? Is that a good argument? <laughs> no? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yes, yes. The idea is that the universe is, is uh, sorry, is eternal and static. So then, if this situation has reached where everything is eternal and static, then there should be thermal equilibrium. Yeah? So there should be thermal equilibrium between the matter between the stars and the stars. But this means that the matter radiates in exactly the same way as the stars are radiating. Yeah, so this is actually no explanation. So I was really made a made a mistake when he, uh, when he argued in this way. Actually, Olbers was not a physicist. He was a, a medical doctor. That was his main, pro uh, main um, uh, profession. But uh, he was very much interested in astrophysics he, uh, and astronomy, I should say, not astrophysics, astronomy mainly. He was a discoverer of, uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the planetoids. I don't quite remember which one. Does anybody? I'm sorry? Vesta. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, well, he, uh, he um, was very influence, influential for the development of, of astronomy here in this area, here in Bremen and around Bremen. So um, Schröter and Lilienthal was a, was a friend of his, and um, so they established here a, a, an, important, um, an important center of uh, astronomy. But uh, when in this case, uh, actually his, uh, his explanation was not a good explanation. And actually I think there is no good explanation if you accept the assumptions. The assumption is that Newtonian physics is correct, that the universe is eternal and that the universe is static. Whatever you assume, if you stick with these assumptions, you run into a contradiction. 
Uh, for instance, if you assume uh, the stars do not fill the universe uh, uh, infinitely, yeah? if you assume there's an island of stars, of course this cannot be static and eternal, it would collapse under its own gravity immediately. Yeah? Or, um, yeah, what else could you assume? Or, of course, you could assume that, uh, that uh, the, the stars are, are flying apart. Yeah? Then uh, an island could exist. Yeah, it could, uh, you could start with an island, but with an expanding island. But that would not be static, of course. Yeah? So whatever you do, you run into a contradiction to some of the assumptions. So as I said, this is known as Olbers paradox. And, uh, but uh, to be historically correct, one should mention that actually the observation is much, much older. And uh, yeah, there's a whole book on this Olbers paradox by Harrison, the famous English uh, cosmologist, and uh, he has uh, yeah um, uh, uh, he has, has been digging into the history of Olbers paradox in quite some detail, and what he found was that the first who actually addressed this problem was Thomas Digges. He was um, a contemporary of Giordano Bruno. This was in 1580, around 1580. And uh, together with, uh, with Giordano Bruno, and at the same time as Giordano Bruno, he was the first who thought about the idea that um, the stars could actually be suns. Yeah? That the stars could be physically exactly the same thing as our sun. This was at this time a revolutionary idea, and Giordano Bruno uh, died for this idea on the stake in Rome, as you know. Right? He was burned by the, uh, by the Pope. And not only for this reason, but uh, this was one of, the, one of the things for which he was indicted, that he claimed that our sun is uh, just the same thing as, as, as the stars up there. And there are infinitely many of them. So Digges also uh, brought this idea forward in England. So he was, uh, the Inquisition was uh, not, so, not so influential in England, so he was not burned on the stake. But um, uh, he had very similar ideas in this respect to, to Giordano Bruno. And uh, he also mentions this problem that then actually the universe should be bright, that the sky should be dark. And uh, as far as I know, he did not offer any solution to this. Then Kepler was aware of this. Of course, uh, you all know about Kepler. And he addressed this problem, when was it? In 1610. Also, apparently without giving a reasonable explanation. And exactly the same calculation which was done by Olbers in 1826 was already, has already been done almost a century before that by a Swiss gentleman by the name of Jean-Pierre de Chezot. I have to admit that I have never heard this name before on any other context that he made exactly, well not in this notation, but uh, he made exactly this, this calculation in 1744. So it's not quite historically correct to call it the Olbers paradox, but uh, here in Bremen we are very proud of Olbers and we stick to this name, of course. So this was um, yeah, a problem which remained unsolved in Newtonian physics. Uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, uh, does anybody know how this problem is solved in general relativity? Actually, I claim that in general relativity this is not a problem. So, do you know in which way it is solved? Does anybody know this? Well, you certainly know that the universe is expanding in general relativity. Yeah, we assume this, so it's not static, so we drop the assumption of staticity. But we still assume that the universe is infinite. So we would still have the conclusion that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that uh, we would have to solve something very similar to this integral, yeah? even if the stars are now expanding. But there's another important, important new aspect in the general relativistic ex um, um, theory. Does anybody know what, what saves us from, yeah? It's either expanding or contracting. That's what the equation is. Yes, saying. where the standard model assumes that from the beginning until now it's, it's always expanding. <coughs> so, and uh, if the universe is actually infinite, and if we could, it's, uh, if we would have to solve this integral up to infinity, then you would still get an infinite brightness. Yeah, but it's not really infinite. That's so the point. It's neither infinite nor um, uh, inf infinitely old. Yes, that's the point. We don't have to, actually we are not allowed to integrate up to infinity because there was a big bang in the general relativistic theory. So we don't see, right now, we don't see the whole universe 
we see only those parts which is within our event horizon. And this is only part of it, so we have a finite quantity here. Yeah? So the Big Bang saves us. The finiteness of time, if we go backward in time. This is uh, the solution which general relativity has to offer for this, uh, for this problem. So in a sense, you might say that uh, the fact that the, star is, that the sky is dark at night, this is an indirect evidence for the, for the Big Bang, that, uh, that our universe uh, is not, not infinitely old. Okay, but I'm jumping ahead, we will talk that about... That means that we don't see just the, the whole light from the stars. Yes, we don't see all. We don't see the whole universe. Okay. There's something like an event horizon. We will talk about this in great detail. Yeah, we see only part of the of the universe. There are stars or galaxies or clusters of galaxies which are so far away from us that the light didn't have time enough to travel towards us uh, since the beginning of the of the world. Yeah, we only see a finite a finite part of the universe. Okay, but this is uh, as I said. Jumping, jumping ahead. So actually the history of this of uh, cosmology, of general relativistic cosmology, of course, began in 1915 when Albert Einstein formulated his field equation. And I think you all know that this happened in November 1915 because we celebrated the 100th birthday of this, this event a few months ago. Albert Einstein presents field equation of general relativity, what we call the Einstein equation. And uh, in which form did he do this in 1915? He did it in the form without a cosmological constant. Yeah, so let me write it down. So this is the Ricci tensor, this is the Ricci scalar, r half g mu nu. And then there's no cosmological constant. And now I have to look up, do I want to have a plus or a minus? I never know what, uh, to which conventions I, uh, I have a plus. Kappa is Einstein's gravitational constant, and T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor. So I will remind you in the next lecture what these qualities mean, but I hope that uh, all of you have seen this before. So the essential thing is this was a field equation without a cosmological constant. Here is no cosmological term. And well, as soon as the uh, field equation was around, Einstein, of course, uh, discussed uh, all kinds of consequences. Very, uh, very uh, shortly after he had established the field equation, he discussed the issue of gravitational waves in 1916. I think you all have heard that gravitational waves now finally have been detected last September, so the announcement was made in February this year. Actually, if I had known that this announcement would come, then I had um, <laughs> given a course on gravitational waves in this term. <laughs> but uh, I think I will do this next year, next year again. So I've done it two years ago with, together with Klaus Lemmertzahl. So we did a course on gravitational waves. And it's certainly now time to do this again. So next summer term I will talk about this. Uh, Einstein also, well actually Schwarzschild then, very soon after this, uh, the field equation uh, was presented, uh, Schwarzschild found uh, the solution which is named after him, which describes uh, uh, space-time around a, uh, a spherically symmetric star. And uh, another thing which Einstein did was that he looked for cosmological solutions. That he looked for a solution which could describe the universe as a whole. And he made the simplest assumption for the energy momentum tensor, so that it is, uh, yeah, should not be more complicated than a perfect fluid and everything should be homogeneous in space and isotropic in space. And he found that it was not possible to construct a static solution. At that time, not only Einstein, but the vast majority of, of all physicists, astrophysicists, cosmologists, was of the opinion that the universe should be static. It should be the same at all times. And Einstein wasn't able to produce a solution which uh, had this property. And that's why he introduced the cosmological constant. So this was in 1916. So again, introduces the cosmological constant, which is nowadays unanimously denoted with capital lambda. Actually, in the original paper by Einstein, it's denoted with a lowercase lambda. But today we all write a capital lambda, so this gives an additional term. Plus lambda is a constant, no half, no half, sorry. 
of a team union. So he just introduced it by hand, not very well motivated at this time, because he wanted to produce uh, a, a static cosmological solution. In later years, actually, this term was very well motivated. If you just assume that the left-hand side should be second order in the metric, and that this quantity should satisfy a conservation law, that energy should be conserved, then you can prove that the left-hand side must have this form. Yeah? This is the famous, uh, what's the name, <laughs> Lovelock theorem. Yeah? Maybe you have heard this in a GR course. So nowadays we have very good reason to assume that from a theoretical point of view to allow for this term. And we have also very good reason to allow for it from, observational, from an observational point of view. So the lambda term is very, very important for modern cosmology. We believe that it is there. Actually, so I should finish the sentence. Introduce a cosmological constant to get static cosmological solutions. And with that, actually, he got a, a, cos a static cosmological solution, which is called the Einstein universe. It's a particular Friedman or generalized Friedman solution, generalized in the sense that the lambda is allowed. And we will discuss it in, uh, uh, when we talk about Friedman solution to get static cosmological solutions. So Einstein introduced this in order to get a static universe. Now you all know that nowadays we don't believe that the universe is static. Since the 1920s, the late 1920s, there is some evidence that the universe is expanding. And nowadays we are absolutely convinced that the universe is expanding. And when Einstein uh, uh, learned about this new development, he is supposed to have said that introducing the cosmological constant was the biggest blunder in his life in German, größte Eselei meines Lebens. And um, this is reported by Georgi Gamow, the famous cosmologist. He claims that Einstein said this to him in a conservation conversation. And um, probably it's true. I'm not saying that Gamow is a liar. But if it is true, then I'm fairly sure that it was said only out of a momentary mood that Einstein didn't really think for the rest of his life that the cosmological constant was, uh, was such a big blunder. Actually, Einstein did make a couple of big blunders. Yeah? So he was always at the, at the forefront of research. He always did very revolutionary and very audacious things. And it's, it's quite clear that fairly often you are on the wrong side of the, of the thing. So he did make a number of uh, big mistakes, actually. In the mid-1930s, for a while, he thought that gravitational waves wouldn't exist, right? He soon realized that this was an error, but uh, it was a big error, actually. And he also, he had completely wrong ideas about what's going on at r equal 2m in the Schwarzschild space-time. Yeah, so he never uh, got the right idea that this is only a coordinate singularity. So he did make big blunders in his life, but I think this was definitely not a big blunder. I think this was actually a very good idea. And the cosmological constant will accompany us uh, through the rest of this course. Okay, this was, uh, I already mentioned Friedman. So Friedman was not very much later. So after 1915, 1916, then a group, not a very big group, but a certain group of scientists started working on exact solutions of these equations. And they found a couple of them. Schwarzschild found the solution named after him. Hermann Weyl found a lot of solutions. And uh, Friedman was the first to intensively studied cosmological solutions. So he wrote two papers, one in 22 and the other one in 24. Alexander Friedman. Uh, yeah, finds homogeneous isotropic solutions to Einstein's field equation, which are now named after him. Solutions to Einstein's field equation, and we will study them in detail. And they have a strong tendency, Friedman did it uh, without cosmological constant. Uh, later it was generalized to the case with cosmological constant. And if you do it without cosmological constant, then the general feature of these solutions is that they cannot be static. Yeah? So, and also Friedman found solutions which are actually expanding. And uh, while he discussed them uh, more from a mathematical point of view, he didn't really speak about uh, physics, so he didn't really claim that our universe uh, is expanding, that it started with a singularity. 
but actually this, this was what the equation suggested. Also this paper has a, has a sort of funny history because when it appeared in Zeitschrift der Physik, he wrote in German, yeah? he was a Russian, he was in St. Petersburg, but he came from a German Jewish family and he wrote these papers in German in Zeitschrift für Physik. And Einstein wrote a comment to this. And the comment by Einstein was that he believes that this result is wrong. Yeah? He, uh, he said that uh, I find these results suspicious, verdächtig, yeah? and I believe that uh, um, um, uh, Professor Friedman applied the field equation in the wrong way. That was his comment. And uh, a few months later, actually, Einstein uh, uh, corrected this and he said, actually, I made a calculation, a mistake. Friedman is right. Yeah? So, uh, but it appeared in uh, it appeared with this with this comment from from Albert Einstein uh, in the first version. Okay, uh, so then the mathematical idea was around that uh, yeah there are solutions which are expanding, and the question is how serious should one take them? The first who took the, took them very serious, and in my view should be called the father of the Big Bang theory, was Abbé Lemaitre, Georges Lemaitre. I think that's uh, spelling. He was Belgian, and uh, yeah, as I said already, he was an abbé, so a, a Catholic priest. Yeah, so if you see pictures from him, he has this, this characteristic uh, robe of a of a Catholic priest. So he's one example that uh, being a religious person and being a scientist talking about modern cosmology is not necessarily a contradiction. There are other ones, yeah? so there are the, the Vatican Observatory uh, has, uh, has uh, also many, many uh, well-known and uh, important cosmologists. So nowadays there's no, no um, contradiction between uh, doing modern cosmology and uh, being a, uh, being a believing Catholic. This was different at the time of Galileo, of course, yeah? and Giordano Bruno <laughs> in an extreme way. <laughs> okay, and so Georges Lemaitre um, yeah, rediscusses the Friedman solution. Actually, he did it also with a cosmological constant. And claims that the universe, our universe, the universe we are living in, started from a singularity. He didn't use the word Big Bang, he used the word primeval atom. Yeah? So this thing from which everything started is, yeah, in the idealized theory, point-like uh, object which then exploded and uh, brought the whole universe about. He called it the primeval atom. The word Big Bang was coined much later, I think in the 60s, by Fred Hoyle. And actually Hoyle was an, yeah, was an opponent of this theory. Hoyle was, um, uh, he believed in the steady state theory, that the universe was the same all the time, that it was expanding, but that there was always new matter created and it stayed the same all the time. This is called the steady state theory. And this was a big rival for the Big Bang theory for quite some time. And they said that Hoyle invented this name Big Bang in order to ridicule this idea. Yeah? So it was meant as a to totally idiotic idea. Yeah? That's, that uh, there was this, uh, uh, this Big Bang at the, at the start of our universe. But, but it stuck. Yeah? And it's, of course it's taken serious nowadays. So. Nobody who uses the word Big Bang nowadays uh, means it in a, in a ridiculing way. But Lemaitre, I think, it's really fair to say that Lemaitre was the first who really took this idea, idea seriously, uh, who also um, tried to compare it with observation. Yeah? So the next entry will be Hubble. So the idea that our universe is expanding and started from an initial singularity is uh, uh, usually uh, associated with Hubble. Actually, Lemaitre also makes, uh, uh, makes statements about observations and that there's a certain indication that the universe is expanding. He didn't really uh, yeah, uh, corroborate it with, with very strong uh, observational evidence, but at least he, um, uh, he thought that uh, 
there's, there's good reason to assume that our universe is expanding. So Lemaitre should really be, uh, uh, be mentioned um, together with, with Hubble and Gamow, which I mentioned a little bit later, when, uh, when it is about the, the fathers of the Big Bang theory. Lemaitre was the first. And then 29 came Hubble. I think you have heard about this. Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, yeah, uh, establishes, let me write it this way, the distance redshift relation. Relation, which we now call the Hubble law. So what did he do? He was an observing astronomer, right? So he had observations, he, and he made himself observations together with humanism in the United States. And what he plotted was the distance of galaxies, and here's a redshift. So if you can uh, realize uh, spectral lines in the light which comes from distant sources, then you can read the redshift, right? So you know, for instance, where in the lab uh, the sodium line is at which wavelengths. If you observe it at the different wavelengths uh, from a source in the sky, then you say the light is redshifted by this corresponding amount. So it is directly measurable. Distance is more difficult. But I think you have all heard about the, the long story of how, how the distance ladder was established. The sea fields play an important role in this, and then other methods were used. So Hubble already had some reasonable ideas about distances of, of, of uh, at least some galaxies, not very far away from modern point of view, but up to a certain distance. And what you get was, if you look at the, the door, you got a completely irregular <laughs> point of dots. And then he said, oh, there's a linear relation. That's, uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely audacious what he did. Yeah? If you look at the data, you say, I don't see. If you do this in the lab, yeah, as a student in first or second semester, the tutor would say, it's ridiculous. You don't get any points for this. Yeah? <laughs> but Hubble did this. And the funny thing is, when observations draw on, when more and more observations were found, actually this was corroborated more and more. Yeah, actually, <laughs> it was absolutely right. <laughs> but at this time, it was, really, it was really very, very audacious. But that's what he claimed in this paper. There's a linear relation between redshift and distance. Now, how do we interpret the redshift? Well, the most natural way is to interpret it as a Doppler effect. Yeah, if something is redshifted, something is redshifted if it moves away from you. Yeah, that's a Doppler effect, which we know very well from sound, and this is also true for light. Well, relativistically, the formulas are a little bit different, but uh, in essence, it's uh, very similar to sound. So um, <coughs> if you interpret the redshift in this way, then it means that the galaxies are moving away from us. Yeah? And this means we live in, a, in an expanding universe. So usually what you read in, uh, yeah, in uh, popular books about astronomy is that Hubble established the fact that our universe is expanding. Actually, if you look at the papers, that's not what he claimed. In this respect, he was very careful. Yeah? He was audacious in drawing this, this line, but he was very careful as far as interpretation is concerned. He doesn't say in the paper that the universe is expanding. He just establishes this linear relation. But of course, this was... Um, this was exactly what Lemaitre had, uh, had uh, claimed before. And um, uh, well, the observation, as I said, it, it, uh, uh, they, were, they were carried on and they became better and better. And uh, the linear law was, uh, was uh, verified uh, very well. And uh, very, very shortly after this time, more or less everybody was convinced that actually our universe is expanding. And uh, in particular, Einstein gave up the idea of a, of a static universe uh, immediately after that, or very, very shortly after that. So the idea of an expanding universe, as I said, was brought forward by Lemaitre. But uh, the work of Lemaitre was more or less purely... Ge oh, there's another thing. Before I come to Gamow, I should mention Zwicky. This was in 1936. This is something which became later very, very relevant for cosmology. For Zwicky, the famous Swiss born astronomer, postulates dark matter. Uh, 
actually in galaxy clusters. What he did was he analyzed um, a cluster of galaxies and he, he analyzed uh, uh, yeah, uh, the visible mass. So from, from the stars we, we observe, from the brightness we observe, you can estimate uh, the mass which is in this cluster. And you can also estimate the, the motion of the cluster. And what Zwicky found was that this cluster cannot be stable. That uh, it is, there's not enough mass in order to keep the cluster together. So the cluster would, uh, uh, would uh, yeah, uh, the, the constituents uh, would have to move apart. But as they obviously don't do this, he, he said there must be more matter than we see. A large part, actually the majority of the matter in this galaxy clusters must be dark. This was postulated in 1936. At this time it was not taken very seriously. Probably most astro uh, astrophysicists thought, well, the evidence is not strong enough in order to make such a far-reaching reaching assumption. But as you certainly know, this is exactly what we believe to be true nowadays that a very large part of the matter in the universe is dark and this idea goes back to 1936 so it's not a recent, not a recent development. I will come to other, other, uh, other things which uh, gave further evidence to this. As I said at this time it was not really taken seriously but it is taken seriously since the 1980s or something like that. And nowadays we are fairly convinced that dark matter exists and we don't know what it is but we have fairly good evidence that it is there. So this came in between, so I was talking about the, yeah, the initial singularity, Lemaitre had called it the primeval atom, but he had discussed it, uh, yeah, not really from a physical point of view, I would say from more from a geometrical point of view. Yeah, he was considering Einstein's field equation, he said, aha, the solution has this property, and uh, then there must be this initial state. The first who really thought about the kind of physics which was going on at a very early stage of the universe, very, very shortly after this, this thing has exploded, was Georgi Gamov, the Russian physicist. This began in 46, I think. So he was a Russian, but then he emigrated to the United States, and he made this work actually in the United States. So he investigates the state of matter. close to the initial singularity from a physical point of view. So he really discussed what kind of, what kind of nuclei could have, could have been formed at an early stage and questions of this sort close to the initial singularity. And he called the state, well, well in, English, in English it is usually pronounced Eilen. That's the name he gave to this object at the beginning. Uh, Pavel, is Pavel here? Yes, it's, uh, I think it's a Russian word, right? And it's pronounced Ulen, is that true? Mm. Ah, you, I, don't know. I thought you know Russian. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what it means. Okay, so maybe I'm, I'm, uh, my information is wrong. But Well, in English, usually people say Ilem, but uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, if this is really the the right pronunciation. Yeah. Well, well, the, the Russian U looks like a Y, right? And this, yeah, is, yeah. this is my hypothesis that it was, was a misreading of this, this Russian character. But maybe I'm wrong. But it is written in, in English uh, how, how could it be read? I mean, yeah. I mean this is just similarity between, between letters. Okay. And not, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you don't know what the word means. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, that's what he called it. And uh, where well, this is culminated in the famous paper by, uh, maybe you have heard about this, by Alpha, Beta, and Gamow. This was a little later, <laughs> Gamow paper. You know the story, right? <laughs> I think this was 1948. So actually, it's a paper by Ralph Alpha and by Georgi Gamow. But uh, just as a, as a pun on the Greek alphabet, they wrote Hans Bethe uh, as a co-author on this, so now it becomes Alpha, Beta, Gamma, right? So, <laughs> Beta was not involved in this. Uh, so this was a paper which came out of these, these ideas that, um, uh, and it's, it's a paper on, on the kind of, uh, yeah, of nuclei which can form at a very early stage of the universe. So that's, uh, yeah, the, 
the predecessor of, of what uh, later was called nucleosynthesis. Yeah, it was a starting point of this, uh, of this line of thought. And actually, the paper where Gamow is involved, in these papers, there is nothing about the cosmic background radiation, well, at least not at the beginning. The first paper where the cosmic background radiation is predicted is a paper without Gamow. It's often said that Gamow uh, was, uh, was uh, the person who, um, uh, uh, who predicted the cosmic background radiation. Probably he was involved in the discussion, but in the first paper where it is written, he's not an author. It's by Alpha and Herman. And this is also 48. Well, Alpha and Robert Herman predict cosmic background radiation. Yeah, of something like like four Kelvin, three to three to five Kelvin, something in this in this order. Yeah, so the the reasoning was, if this whole idea is true, that we started from such initial singularity, then yeah, the photons which filled the universe at an early stage, they have become more and more diluted, and they should still be present as a more or less homogeneous and isotropic background, and they should be observable as a, yeah, as a radiation coming from all directions with, uh, with this temperature. This low temperature, of course, is an effect of the dilution, right? In the beginning, it was very hot, and the course of time, it became, cold, it became colder and colder. And they calculated, they estimated the temperature which, uh, uh, which uh, the thing should have now. Actually, at this time, 1948, there was already observational evidence for the existence of the cosmic background radiation, but neither Alpha and Herman knew this, neither the person, nor the person who had made the observation. So, actually, it was indirectly already found in 1941 by Andrew McKellar. Is that the spelling? Let me check. Uh, yes, McKellar. What did he do? Well, he analyzed spectra of, um, of certain molecules in the, um, in the universe. It was uh, uh, what we in German we call cyan, CN. What is that in English? Cyanide. Cyanide. Cyanide is, I think it's something else. So it's CN. Chemical sign is CN. <laughs> this was the molecule he, um, he analyzed. And in order to explain the observations, so he observed a certain, um, a certain transition in these molecules uh, from um, yeah, a, rotational, um, a, ro a rotational transition, which could be explained if one assumes that the whole thing, that the whole atom is in a bath, it's in a, in a bath of temperature 3, 4, 5 Kelvin, in this order of magnitude. Yeah? That's written in the paper, yeah? that, uh, he, that it looks as if these molecules in the universe are in the thermal bath of this temperature. But when actually uh, Alpha and Herman then uh, predicted the cosmic background radiation, they didn't bring this into connection with this observation, and it was apparently forgotten for many, many years. So uh, I will talk more about the cosmic microwave microwave back, uh, radiation and its detection, which is a very involved story. But actually, it began in 1941 by McKellar. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure if he was still alive when the Nobel Prize was given for the detection in 78 or something like that. But uh, one could very well argue that uh, if he was still alive, that he would also be a, a reasonable candidate. OK, we are now in the year. Let me look at Oh, OK, fine. I think I can manage the rest in the uh, in the time I have. Yeah, in 1948, there was a steady state theory. This was for many years a very serious rival of the Big Bang theory. So uh, it was uh, brought forward by two Viennese physicists, Hermann Bondi and Tommy Gold, and the Englishman Fred Hoyle. 
Actually, also Bondi and Gold worked in England at this time. Gold then emigrated to the United States. Gold is uh, famous. Uh, he was one of the two persons who, uh, who said that uh, pulsars are rotating neutron stars. Yeah. So there was an Italian simultaneously with him, but uh, together with him, he was the first who gave the right interpretation of what pulsars are. And uh, Bondi is maybe best known for his uh, TV course on general relativity. He gave in the 1960s in England uh, a BBC course on relativity, which was uh, uh, it was made into a little book, so I, I as, a, as a young student, I, uh, I, I read this book with great enthusiasm and, uh, and he became very, very popular in England. So he was similar to what in Germany was Heinz Haber at this time, maybe the older ones. <laughs> oh, there are no older ones in the audience, <laughs> probably you don't remember Heinz Haber. So he was a TV professor in the 1960s and 70s in Germany. And Bondi played a similar, similar role in England and brought relativity to the people. And so they, they had the idea, they rejected the idea of a Big Bang. There was no Big Bang, no initial singularity. So they said uh, the universe is the same all the time. It is expanding, all right, we observe it, we cannot deny this. But uh, this, is, uh, yeah, this, this is maintained, this expansion is maintained by, uh, yeah, by a continuous creation of matter. So matter always comes about and then it moves away. So in a sense it violates, uh, violates uh, reasonably well-established conservation laws. But many people found this idea at this time attractive that the initial singularity could be avoided. And uh, maybe for some years even the majority of uh, theoretical uh, astrophysicists uh, were in favor of the steady state theory. But this collapsed completely with the discovery of the, uh, of the cosmic microwave background because this was exactly what the Big Bang Theory had predicted and what the steady state theory, uh, well, they, they tried to explain it, but they really had problems and uh, more or less they, um, uh, yeah, they had to modify the theory in a way that it was no longer really attractive. And the theory died with the death of these three gentlemen. Yeah? So they, for the rest of their lives, they kept, they kept steady state theory uh, alive. They always, uh, through, their, uh, through their whole lives, they believed that this was the right, uh, right theory. But uh, around the years 2000, 2002, 2004, uh, all of them then passed away. And uh, now I think there's nobody in the world who is working on steady state theory. Maybe very few eccentrics, but uh, this is no longer taken seriously. I should mention the work of my teacher, Wolfgang Grindler. Actually, it was a PhD thesis. He wrote this PhD thesis in, in England. Uh, his thesis as his advisor was Withrow. And uh, he was an opponent of the steady state theory. And this PhD thesis uh, was aiming at uh, yeah, uh, arguing against the steady state theory. And in the course of this work, Wolfgang Rindler introduced the notion of event horizon and particle horizon. I think you all know that the notion of event horizon is crucial for understanding of black holes. But this was not what it was originally meant for. It was formulated in, uh, in the context of cosmology. And we will see in this course that also in cosmology this plays a very important role for our understanding of what's going on in the universe. And yeah, I mentioned already that the cosmic background radiation was indirectly found in 1941. Actually, it was directly found three times in the mid-50s. This is very little known. This was in the years 1955 to 1958. It was three times independently discovered. The first was Emile Leroux. The first was a Russian gentleman with a complicated name. I have to copy this. Tigran Shmaonov. Shmaonov. And the third was in the United States at the Bell Laboratories at Ohm. At Ohm, find the cosmic background radiation.
Actually, for various reasons, this was not recognized at this time. So in the case of Leroux, one can easily explain why it wasn't recognized. Leroux wrote in French, and he publishes in a journal which not even the French people read. Yeah, a completely unknown journal. So this is, of course, the most stupid thing you can do. Yeah. So that's the reason why this was, this was found only decades after the paper appeared. Yeah. And yes, yes. Uh, you did the observation in a very similar uh, spectral range as uh, later by Penzias and Wilson. I will come to Penzias and Wilson in a, mo in a moment. He did it with a very similar instrument, and uh, exact. Uh, if he hadn't, if he hadn't been so stupid to publish this in this uh, in this uh, obscure French journal, he would have got the Nobel Prize, certainly. Um, and uh, it was uh, the other two. Uh, they also Shmonov made these observations in in Russia. And uh, apparently it wasn't really uh, yeah, disseminated at this time. And Ohm did it at the Bell Laboratories. This was known as a rumor by some people, but uh, yeah, it was not considered to be sufficiently strong evidence to... Um, actually, the, the Russians knew about this. Yeah? So, so Novikov and, uh, and Doroshkevich in, uh, in Russia, they knew about this work, this work by Ohm. But, uh, Apparently, they misinterpreted. So they didn't really read from this work that the cosmic background radiation has already been detected. But uh, in hindsight, in, in Peebles' book, in the introduction of Peebles' book, this, uh, this is, or, or was it, sorry, no, I think it's a different book. No, 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 it's not Peebles. In some, in one of the cosmology books, in the introduction, the story of the cosmic background radiation is described in, in fairly great detail. And, uh, um, well, there, if, if you read this, actually, the evidence is fairly clear that the cosmic background radiation was found already in the, in the 1950s. Okay, then uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the theoretical study on the singularities began. Uh, yeah, this was the whole period, I would say, between 60 and 70. Um, the initial singularity was... was investigated theoretically, and it was in particular found that it is not an artifact of the symmetry. So there's this Russian word, work, BKL, Bilinsky, Kralatnikov, Lifshitz, I'd mentioned this before, and Penrose Hawking in, in England. So coming back to the cosmic background radiation, 1946 was an important theoretical paper where the cosmic background radiation was clearly predicted with precise um, numerical values also what was to be expected by Novikov, Igor Novikov and Andrei Doroshkevich. make very precise predictions of cosmic background radiation. At the same time in the United States, Robert Dickey and his group also started, um, yeah, uh, actually looking for the, uh, for the, they started the program actually looking for the cosmic background radiation. Actually it was found then, the official discovery which was recognized was by pure ac accident. I think you know about this story, it was by Penzias and Wilson. In, at, the, at the Homedale um, radio telescope, Arno Penzias, German born, uh, American physicist and uh, Wilson, what's the first name? Robert, I think. I think it's R. Wilson. Detect the cosmic background radiation. I think you know the story. So they were working with this, this Homedale radio telescope and they had a mysterious uh, yeah, kind of noise. 
which they couldn't explain. Yeah, so they wanted to make some precise measurements with the thing, and they were they were perturbed by this kind of homogeneous noise which was there. And they thought actually it was uh, yeah, the, the culprits <coughs> were, were the, the pigeons which were flying around. Yeah? That they, as they formulated it, that they covered the, uh, the, uh, the dish with, um, with a dielectric substance. <laughs> yeah, that's the way in which they formulated it. And actually they started shooting the pigeons. Yeah, so. Uh, I think it was Wilson who, who brought his, his gun from his home. Most Americans have a gun at home and then they shot the pigeons. But nonetheless, the signal remained. Yeah? And then they talked to, to Robert Dickey, the theorist, which, uh, who was working uh, a few kilometers apart. And they told him, my goodness, you have found the cosmic background radiation, which all the people are looking for. Yeah? And Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for this. Yeah? Many people say this, is, this was not a lucky decision. Yeah? <laughs> Uh, not, a, not a good decision, yeah? So there were other people who contributed in an elect intellectual, yeah, more valuable way to this discovery. I think that's certainly true. And uh, I leave it to you to, to think uh, about whom uh, could have given the Nobel Prize uh, in addition. Well, well it's, it's okay. They made the discovery, so, so they should get the Nobel Prize, but they got it alone. I think this, is, this was really a mistake. So I would say that the natural candidate would be Dickey, yeah, because he explains the observations. that he, If McKellar was still alive, he would be a candidate. Uh, with Novikov and Doroskiewicz, the problem is that these are two. Yeah? The Nobel Prize can only be given to three people. Yeah? So then the problem is yeah, you cannot choose one of them if they are together on the paper, right? So, but just giving it to Penzias and Wilson for a, yeah, just an accidental discovery, I think this was a little bit, uh, this was not quite fair. Okay, so Nobel Prize in 1978 for Penzias and Wilson. And this was the observation which killed the steady state theory. Yeah? From, then, from then onwards, everyone believed in Big Bang. Everyone except uh, these three gentlemen. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. Yeah, I have five minutes. That's enough for the rest. Yeah, I've talked about dark matter. Dark matter was predicted by Zwicky, but as I said, nobody took it really serious at that time. In the 1970s, there came additional evidence for dark matter, and then it was taken seriously. And the person who brought this forward was the American astronomer Vera Rubin. She observed rotation curves in galaxies. So she looked at galaxies which are viewed edge-on in the sky, and by analyzing the spectral lines, she could discover with which velocity one side comes towards us and the other side moves away from us. And by analyzing these rotation velocities, she found that the matter which is in the galaxies is not enough to produce these rotation curves. So the way in which the velocity changes with radius should be completely different if the matter which we see is the whole matter. So she also concluded there must be dark matter in galaxies, not in galaxy clusters. Zwicky had argued there must be dark matter in galaxy clusters. Now there was additional evidence that there is dark matter in galaxies. And the two things together now make a fairly strong argument. So from then, from this time on, was a series of papers. First she investigated the Andromeda galaxy in 1970, and then other galaxies in the following years. And in the course of 10 years or so, she had accumulated such an amount of data that there was really very, very strong evidence that dark matter exists in galaxies. And that's what we believe up to now that there is dark matter in galaxies. We don't know what it is, but we know that it is there. So this was Vera Rubin. Let me write 70 to 80. <coughs> Finds evidence for dark matter.
in galaxies by analyzing rotation curves. <coughs> Oops. Oops. <clears throat> On a theoretical side, in 1980, a new idea came about, which proved very, proved, uh, very fruitful. And this goes under the name of inflation. So by that time, people were fairly convinced that our universe is expanding. But they assumed that the rate of expansion became slower in the course of time, from the beginning. Yeah, so there was a big bang, the whole thing flew apart, and then from then onwards, the universe was expanding, but the expansion becomes smaller. The rate of expansion becomes smaller. It's a decelerated expansion. That was people assumed. But in the year 1980, inflation was brought forward, which was the idea that there was a period early in the universe, where actually the expansion was very rapidly accelerating. Yeah? And that's what one calls inflation, meaning blowing up. Yeah? You know this from, from finance, yeah? that something becomes bigger. That's what inflation means. <laughs> was brought forward. Actually, if you look in an American paper, then you will unanimously find the name Alan Guth as a founder of, uh, um, of um, uh, inflation. Uh, my Russian friends are always very angry about the fact that the Americans do not properly cite Russian works. And this is a good example for this. Actually, the first person who suggested inflation was a Russian by the name of Alex Stavobinsky in 1980. So he was the first who suggested this. And then, a few months later, came Alan Guth. I don't want to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to discredit the work, uh, the work by Guth in any way, but he was later than Starobinsky, so the, one should mention uh, at least the two of them uh, uh, at the same level. And then it was, was further developed by many other people. Andre Linde was strongly involved, and Steinhardt was involved, and others. So this is an idea which was brought about by theorists in order to explain some things in a better way. So there were some problems with the model of cosmology at this time. One of the problems was that it wasn't understandable how parts of the universe which are very far away, which how they could have communicated with each other in order to produce a homogeneous cosmic background radiation. Yeah? That's the so-called horizon problem, and inflation could solve this. Then there are other problems, for instance, that uh, yeah, from some ideas, one uh, uh, some ideas predicted uh, that uh, magnetic monopoles have come into existence at an early stage of the university in a great number. Have you ever seen a magnetic monopole? Neither have I. So where are they? <laughs> so inflation is a, is a something which can explain how they have been diluted. So this could explain some some things. So let me finish just uh, in the last two minutes. Uh, the, the remaining entries are on, uh, on the observational side. The cosmic background radiation was studied in the, uh, in the, uh, between 89 and 93 by the COBE satellite. Studies cosmic background radiation. And it found that uh, that uh, cosmic, uh, uh, cosmic background radiation is isotropic to an extremely high degree, but there are, that there are tiny deviations. And that's what uh, Smoot and Mather got the Nobel Prize for. So they were two of the PIs of this project, the Nobel Prize in 2006. And by now there are two further satellites, I think you have heard about this, 2010, no, 2001 to 2010, there was WMAP, another satellite which studied the cosmic background radiation, and 2008 to 2013, the Planck satellite. So the information on the cosmic background radiation we got from these um, very precise information we got from these two recent satellite uh, expeditions. And the last thing I mentioned, I should, have, I should squeeze this in here. In 98, the idea of dark energy was established. So the accelerated, 
accelerated expansion of the universe. Not in an early stage, not only in this uh, inflation, but now. That right now our universe is not decelerating, expanding, but accelerating, expanding. It was established by investigating, um, by using a certain type of supernovae as uh, standard candles. And that was uh, Perlmutter, Ries and Schmidt got the Nobel Prize for. We will discuss this, of course, in detail. When was it? 2011? Uh, exactly. And that uh, requires the idea of dark energy. So dark energy was, uh, was invented in order to explain this uh, accelerating expansion. The word dark energy was coined in exactly this year by Michael Turner. Yeah. Dark energy is, yeah, what dark energy is, that's a different question. <laughs> we will discuss this in detail. But that it must be there in order to explain this observation. That's a fact which was established in this year. Okay, I'm already one minute over time, so I think I stop now. And see you again on Friday. <laughs>